Hello, everyone. I'm so glad you could join us. We've got some folks trickling in here. We're going to just go ahead and get started. Um, we're not going to have a lot of time today, so you want to make sure and get through as much as we can. Um, we're so glad to have you all here with us. Welcome to Exploring Energy. Um, I, we are presenting this here, MREA, the Montana Renewable Energy Association. I'm Ivora Glenn, our program coordinator at MREA. So I'll let you all know that um, all attendees have been muted. If you have questions, you can submit them directly to the chat. Uh, we will be doing a Q&A at the end of the presentation, but if you have questions, please submit them at any time. Um, we don't have a lot of time for this presentation. As I mentioned, it'll be just about 30 minutes. So if we don't get to your question, please email us and we can make sure that we get your question answered. I also wanna let you all know that this presentation is being recorded. So just get on started with it. As I said, this presentation series is brought to you by MREA. We have a mission to foster the growth of renewable energy for all Montanans through education, advocacy, and industry engagement. Today's topic is storage and batteries, um, which we are very excited to be presenting on. And we're super pleased to have Dan Brandborg of SBS Solar to talk with us about storage and batteries today. So Dan started his career in photovoltaics with SolarX in 1983, one of the first US-based volume manufacturers. In 1985, he and his wife Becky started Sunilco, the Sun Electric Company, focused on designing and selling mail order solar systems to a predominantly off-grid customer base. Dan is an NABSEP certified installer with over 800 residential and commercial systems on his resume. Dan has lived off grid as well as on grid and believes deeply in energy sustainability. He is an avid outdoorsman and loves exploring and maintaining trails in the back country with his mules and buddies. He is a third generation Montana environmental activist and enjoys working on his farm in the Bitterroot Valley. Dan is also an electric vehicle nerd, teaching detailed classes on the subject. So Dan, we again are so grateful to have you join us today. And I am going to unmute you and pass it over to you to talk with us about storage and batteries. Take it away. Well, thank you, Laura. Thanks for that nice introduction. Um, well, excellent. It's always interesting to Zoom when I'm used to a uh, living room, kitchen table environment to talk about these good things. Um, and I often say, catch me if I'm tangent and going off into the weeds somewhere you're not interested. You can't really do that on Zoom. So I'll see if I can stay to my, my notes here to the left that I'll glance at. So anyhow, um, we'll be talking about batteries, solar, uh, why batteries, why we've got so much interest in batteries, almost all our inquiries for solar also ask about batteries. Um, what's available now and what we can use in our homes and businesses now, um, where we're going in the near future, and then how uh, electric vehicles uh, can come into play and uh, that role in the future. So I'd like to start with a description of our system here in the Bitterroot in Hamilton. Um, we uh, use our place as a kind of a test facility to really bring the product, new products on and, and experience them and see if, you know, if they're really something that we want to rec recommend. So um, we have a farm here, commercial farm. We use, um, uh, let's just say we use about three times the average, of what the average U.S. home uses, uh, about 9,000 kilowatt hours a year is what we uh, use is just a number for the average home if there is such a thing. So we use um, three times that because we've got a bunch of commercial activity. So we've got a larger array to, to handle that. We handle about 90% of our um, loads uh, annually. We're on a Levada Electric Co-op, uh, which only allows us to export 10 kilowatts at a time um, into the grid, which is something we've had to work around. And 
batteries are a great way to work around that. We'll talk about that more. Um, our places over the last 25 years we've been here at this at this facility or this home and um, uh, we designed everything around the megawatt, which is you know a real primary thing of course anybody using or conscious about their energy consumption that we just uh, the megawatt is the the no watt is the best way to uh, reduce the size and costs of a system solar system lots of insulation type buildings heat pumps um, real advocate of heat pumps uh, hot water heat pumps and home heat pumps Without uh, without the heat pump, we wouldn't be able to heat and cool, uh, you know, to get a net zero type home in Montana. But now we we can, which is wonderful. So we have a 10 kilowatt hour lithium battery in our place. We've had it for three years. Um, it's a backup design, which we'll talk about. Um, so we're there for the the battery's there for grid outage. We're still using some propane and some diesel, but with all the things happening and all the progress with batteries, um, where two years ago I said we'd never be able to separate from fossil fuels, um, but uh, I, I see that happen. We, we can do that uh, in, in the near future, which is really fun. Um, I remember visiting with a customer just a couple of years ago and he said, uh, a long time solar customer with us. He says, you know, I'm Dan, I'm never bringing another um, ice vehicle, uh, internal combustion engine on my place, I'm done. Was, everything's going to be electric. And I was like, wow, that's, you know, that's quite the statement. Well, uh, now, a couple years later, you go, absolutely. Uh, same process here is uh, we will not be buying any uh, more ice vehicles and use the ones we have and convert over to total uh, battery electric vehicles as quickly as we can. So one of the things I'd like to start with is a quick review of, you know, the basic solar system, the grid tie solar system that we're all familiar with and that are so common. Um, you know, the three major components, are very straightforward, solar panels, a, a structure to hold solar panels to the roof or a ground mount, and an inverter. There's three main components. And um, that's, um, that's what makes up a system. Um, solar power flows uh, directly from the array uh, first into the loads that are on in the house, and then uh, any excess power flows out to the grid, uh, leaving the credit on our meter, and we're really basically using the grid as our battery storage. Um, so it works, and it's 100% uh, efficient, really, when you look at conversion or rate of power flowing back and forth. Um, and the Achilles heel of these systems, of course, is what batteries will take care of, and that is uh, power outage. Um, in the grid, you know, the way our inverters are designed, they're designed to protect the linemen. So if the grid goes down, even on a sunny day, so do our systems. Um, so the only way around that is to have um, storage um, at, our, at our homes. So getting into batteries, um, Batteries are you know, very, we can get very deep into it. I have a four hour class on just electric vehicles and batteries. Uh, my, most of that four hours is on batteries. So summarize here and just get into the, the basics and we can get into questions too. But So electrical storage is huge for, um, for the world. Uh, you know, the utilities do their best they can to meet the uh, con consumption needs with production needs, because there's no real slack between the two. The power we're using now in our home is generated basically now. Um, so if you add effective, cost-effective uh, electric storage, you change the whole paradigm. And same with uh, renewables. Uh, some people say it's the second half of renewables that now we have these wind, solar, that at different times of the day, weather conditions, but if we can use uh, electrical storage and batteries, of course, are only one of the forms of um, electric storage that we're talking about energy storage. But uh, what is happening now and, and available now? So, for decades, we've been saying, you know, it's the electric vehicle that is going to make this change for us, and indeed, it has. Um, if it wasn't for what's been going on with electric vehicles, we wouldn't have the options we have. It's kind of a two way street. 
because now we're uh, actually having a hard time with supply of batteries because of the demand for electric vehicles. It'll balance out, but uh, it is we're backed up on the uh, production of uh, stationary batteries. There's a lot of money, billions being spent on R&D uh, with batteries, mainly around lithium chemistry. Um, and uh, so we've got a lot of evolving going on. We've got a lot of really bright people on the planet working on energy storage systems. Uh, and basically, it's, uh, we still have a high cost uh, of the batteries, but it's the same game we played with photovoltaics of give us the demand uh, and then we'll, we'll give you the volume and decrease our production costs. So that's what's happening with batteries and, it, and it, the vehicles are, um, are pushing that, continuing to push that. Um, so how about costs? Get into costs soon, because that's uh, you know, everybody's question. Uh, so for an example, just for a general number, everybody's number is gonna vary a little bit, uh, depending on who you talk to, installing the system for you or purchasing yourself. For a 10 kilowatt hour battery, we're looking at about $7,500, $7,500 for a 10 kilowatt hour battery. And that's before installation. So when we, installation cost is, is significant because of the wiring and such as well. So if we just look at, some folks just come forward and say, well, you know, let's just put a battery in the house, we'll run the battery. Okay, well, let's, you got to back up and do a little bit of math. If we um, see an average home in the US uses about 9,000 kilowatt hours per year. That's about 25 kilowatt hours per day. And we're talking about a 10 kilowatt hour battery. So we can see the problem there. We've got less than a half days worth of storage in a battery with no input from, from solar or any kind of charging. So therein lies the problem. We look at the cost for, um, I mean, what it would cost to run a, a typical home and run all of it. So we've got ways to go around and we've got a number of solutions. And of course, the long-term solution is costs will come down and we'll have larger battery banks um, that will make things a lot more doable. My notes straight here. So there's two um, basic system designs that we look at with batteries. One is self-consumption and the other is uh, backup power. So just uh, self-consumption, uh, is a concept that's, you know, basically we are using the power in our home, in our business um, as, we, as we generate it. So we bias towards uh, putting our loads, electric loads towards the solar day. Um, one of the great uh, possibilities is uh, electric vehicle charging, charge that during the day, if you can, with your uh, timer on your charger. Um, so instead of exporting that power out into the grid, you, you use it um, on site. Uh, so we can program our battery systems to do this, to basically um, charge every day. And then as the solar day comes to the end, you're, you're using your battery. So you just start discharging your battery as the sun goes down in the evening and discharge that battery through the, through the night. To where you end up uh, uh, in the morning with um, or sometime you know early in the day your um, your battery is um, totally discharged or discharged to the setting that you as deep as you want to go um, and then um, do it all again and just do that on a daily basis. In other uh, locales, this is a, a great way to go where we have time of use um, costs for power. Uh, not in Montana, we don't have time of use power variations. So there's really no economic advantage of programming in, in that direction. But it's something I think we'll see more of in the future and certainly going on in other parts of the country. So the main design direction we go here is um, with a backup um, programming. So um, with this design, what we do is we install a, a second electrical meter or breaker panel uh, in the home next to usually right next to the main electric panel. And we take what we call the critical loads or the backed up loads 
uh, like refrigeration, freezing, freezer, lights, communications, basic lights, maybe not all the lights. And then we have that uh, in a, a separate panel um, to when, when the grid goes down, um, we um, stop exporting power to that would hurt alignment. And we only power that portion, uh, that backup panel. So we're not powering everything, um, but we're powering the more critical loads. So let's see. So we disconnect from the grid, follow my notes here a little bit. I love to go off, off my schedule and try to stay on topic here. Or I go off on a tangent. So, um, so basically we're you know, in a grid down situation. And I always, you know, we have these discussions. It's like, well, you've got a battery backup, battery backup system in your home. You really have two, two different ways of operating. One's grid up, and one is grid down. And grid up, you're not going to really know the difference. Their solar power is going to be powering everything when the solar day. Um, grid down, now we turn into uh, an off-grid system. And an off-grid system, we uh, kind of turns us into power plant managers. Um, so we've got to be a little more cognizant of what's going on. Uh, so for years, you know, we've lived with lead acid batteries and the such, which are have so many uh, disadvantages when you compare it to lithium and the new batteries coming on today. Um, and one was you were interpreting voltage uh, of your batteries and as a state of charge. And uh, you really needed to know the difference between 14.8 uh, and, uh, excuse me, let's just say 48, well, 48.8 to uh, 51. You needed to know those voltages. It was diff difficult to understand. Today's systems are much easier to express the state of charge of battery as a percentage. So you can say, oh, my batteries are at 93% state of charge. My batteries are at 50% state of charge. And uh, uh, everything is um, easy to access that way. Um, so then the question becomes, well, how long is that battery gonna last? How long is my battery gonna last in the situation? Well, look at all the variables there. Um, what time of the year is it? Is it January, is it June? Huge difference in our solar day, how much power we're making, um, uh, how much power we're using. You know, typically we use a lot more lights, a lot more power in the wintertime than we do in the summertime in home systems. So it's something we can give you an idea of and say, well, let's look at the backed up loads. Let's get an idea of just how much power you're using here. But we don't really know really well until we're up and running and then monitor and see what the state of charge is, see what it's like, could you? We'd love to have a system run two or three days without, uh, without uh, the, you know, in a grid down situation. But then it depends on your solar input. If you have beautiful sun, sunny days during that time, you could run more loads. And again, it uh, puts the responsibility of, uh, of your solar system where we, today's common system you kind of you monitor it, but you can forget it. It's very, very forgiving. When you're running on a battery, you have a finite uh, amount of power. So it's uh, more, more hands-on. So it's uh, fun, just a, a different uh, dynamic. And why a lot of uh, folks and, uh, you know, when we started, we were all, it was all off-grid. Uh, now we have companies that have come on that have done nothing but on-grid. And we see a little conflict sometimes when those folks are asked to, to design an off-grid system. It is much more complex. Um, and uh, it doesn't work for some folks. They're used to having an uh, infinite amount of power that they can use whenever. We're looking at a, a large building here in the valley, the 19,000 square foot shop. And uh, they wanna power this off-grid because they are away from the power line. But the, uh, the shift in their behavior to go to uh, off-grid with that size of the system and a generator and solar will be dramatic. And some folks just, they just won't put up with it. That's interesting. So being on the grid, I always encourage folks, bring the grid into that piece of property if you at all can. They have the best of all worlds. You have the grid, you have solar, now you have battery, uh, possibly a generator and you're a power plant with basically four different sources. And that's what our grid does for reliability, multiple 
um, generating stations. So let's see here. So where are we going from here? Uh, the future is pretty exciting. It's fun. We are making big strides. Um, what I see is a, a repeat of the computer industry where we have where we had increasing process, uh, processing abilities and decreasing costs and dramatic. I think we're going to see the same thing with batteries as um, as we get more and more um, lithium battery solutions or other chemistry solutions, um, prices are going to come down. And you know the EV electric vehicle industry, I'll say EV, um, is looking for a higher density of power. Um, uh, you know, so less volume and uh, less weight. Well, in a home business situation, we don't really need to worry so much about that. We can handle a little more weight, uh, a little less density. And there are some chemistries that really lend themselves to that, uh, some that don't use cobalt and such. So we've got some great advances there. So then uh, integrating uh, the electric vehicle into a home is another area of, of real interest and in, in where we're going. So we see um, batteries coming on, but we also see um, electric vehicles becoming more and more popular. Uh, by the end of this year, we're gonna have uh, so much more selection than we had last year even, and the costs are coming down. The Chinese are bringing in all kinds of different models and their costs are lower. Um, so just as a comparison, um, we talked about a 10 kilowatt hour uh, lithium home battery. Um, when you look at an electric vehicle, it's not uncommon to have a, a 70 kilowatt hour battery. So seven times larger than what we would have in our home for $7,500 plus installation costs. So how about we bring that battery in and connect it to our, our home system? Uh, and that is where we're going. There's uh, manufacturers that are seeing that and they're the, the competitiveness of one, one vehicle manufacturer to the other is uh, what, what uh, options can we come up with? What can we offer to make us stand out? So we're seeing folks like uh, the Ford, uh, Ford F-150 uh, lightning that's coming out. And so it's a nice battery run truck, but it's also got outlets that will run at 120, 240 volt outlets on the vehicle. And it's called vehicle to load. Basically, we're taking power from the vehicle going to uh, the load. Um, now, of course, we can charge our car from uh, our solar system and the grid, but we're not totally, we're not totally interactive. Um, basically, you know, what we have now, we have a, a grid to vehicle, our car charger, okay? And then we have in some vehicles and probably more and more coming on quickly, vehicle to load. So we can take the power from that car, that truck and do again, set up a, a secondary electric panel like we do with our residential batteries and power that directly from the, you know, this amount of power you've got sitting in your vehicle. So the next step would be to go totally bi-directional. So say the grid goes down, um, not only can we take power from your vehicle battery, but we could also put it back in with our solar system or the grid or in grid down situation, we've got a sustainable um, large battery system. And now we're talking, we're talking about a, six, a 70 to 100 kilowatt hour battery on a home. That's the kind of storage we need to really handle a good number of loads. You know, we used to say in the off grid system, so much a battery is the heart of the system. And it's really easy to mm -hmm. come in higher amount, larger battery, because it just handles more variables. So the larger the battery, the less issues you have. The negative, of course, is, is the cost. Um, all right, so I wanted just to run by the, the efficiency of, of using a battery um, and, and vehicles. It kind of ties in here that, um, you know, when we look at our ICE vehicles, our internal combustion engine vehicles, we're looking at uh, energy efficiency of converting that that petroleum to motor power, maybe 30 to 40 
35% efficient. So let's say 35% efficient. Uh, so the rest of that energy is really expressed as heat. So it's pretty easy to heat a, a diesel truck because you've got a lot of waste heat to begin with. Um, and the enter the uh, motors, the electric motors on an EV, we're looking at more in the 90s, 90% 90 efficient. So the, the variation there is so huge, a one third the amount of uh, power to get you down the road. Uh, another thing that goes on that's designed in electric vehicles is uh, regenerative braking. So, um, you know, you're pretty much one pedal driving and you come off the accelerator and the motors start generating electricity and putting it back into the battery. It's uh, fun here to go over one of our passes in Montana and get to the top of the Continental Divide and, and watch uh, your mileage remaining in your tank and come down to the bottom and you've gained power. You know, it takes more power to go up one side, of course, but it's fun that you're, you're capturing that power and putting it back in. So just for an example to illustrate this a little better, I looked at a 100 mile example, went over to Butte for the energy fair with MREA and uh, that 100 mile drive for us. And I looked at using the, the Subaru at 35 miles per gallon versus uh, uh, our electric. And uh, basically uh, on our electric, we get about three miles for every kilowatt hour of energy. So three miles per, per one kilowatt hour. So for that 100 miles, you use 33, uh, 33 kilowatt hours. Um, so you do the math of 33 kilowatt hours times from Northwest Energy, about 12 cents a kilowatt, come up with about um, $4 of electricity for buying from utility. Uh, then, then if you take that same um, you take that uh, our Subaru of 35 miles per gallon and you run that 100 miles, that consumes about three gallons of gas and roughly about a little more than $10 worth of um, gasoline. So we go from $4 to $10. Um, we can see this, the economics there, of uh, what's going on. And that basically is the bottom line when it comes to electric vehicles of what's going on. Uh, the, the demand as folks figure out the lower cost of ownership, uh, it's that's what's going to drive things, and that's what is uh, captured. You know, the automakers around the planet to to be uh, shifting to this um, as you know as it works with them. Uh, it's a huge change, but they see that as coming on um, fast and. Uh, uh, really, really quickly, more quick than a lot of folks think. Uh, let's see. So the other fun part, you know, for being solar folks is now, you know, charge that car with your electrons from your solar array. Um, do that here with the timer on the charger to um, try to charge. We work at home mainly. So, uh, we can charge during the day. So it does advocate business. If you're at a work, have chargers there as well, again, during the solar day. Um, but it's fun to drive around on solar electrons. It's, uh, you really feel like you're a big part of the solution. And uh, it's interesting, if I don't have in a, my conversations with the folks over the, the kitchen table, if they don't bring up um, kind of being part of the environmental solution, I usually don't have a customer, which is really, really interesting and, and, and a lot of fun because we're all here to uh, solve problems, not to create them. Or, so we so we want to believe, right? So one other thing I wanted to mention here, and I'm getting, you know, get close here to just going into questions, um, uh, virtual power plants. Um, virtual power plants is where a number of uh, home business um, battery-based solar systems are connected um, via uh, with software that allows the utility to go and extract power from your personal battery or your system uh, to when there are surges. 
and uh, it's more easily done than one would think. And uh, basically, uh, the utilities are always looking for ways to control the peak power. And we get a lot of air conditioners or such coming on at the same time. Uh, they may need just power for a few minutes here or there just to get over starting surges. Uh, and they have dip in and take some power and then turn around and bring the charge of battery right back up. So the way utilities do this, you know, typically is with what they call them peaker plants that are built just for taking care of these larger loads, not really a base load, but more of a peak load, like what is being proposed in uh, Laurel outside of Billings by Northwestern Energy with uh, natural gas. So the beauty of uh, this would be a, be a renewable way of using our batteries and then being reimbursed for it. Um, these systems are up and operating in other parts of the um, country. And uh, I was reading about one homeowner in uh, Massachusetts who made uh, $2,000 um, last year as part of that program of sharing his battery with the utility. So another way to pay off the cost of the system. Not here now, right? Not in Montana yet. Um, our dominant utility doesn't even want to talk to us about those kind of things. Um, we do have a number of progressive co-ops in the state that I uh, live in hope for some changes there, um, but it's uh, a ways down the road. So that was the basic things I wanted to cover and maybe Vora, um, go for questions and see, see what we come up with. Yeah, absolutely. We have several questions coming in. Just thank you again very much, Dan, for being here. I know you covered a lot of things in this very short amount of time, you know, EVs, off-grid, grid tied. So yeah, I will start giving out some questions. Just a reminder to everyone else who's listening here, um, please feel free to submit your questions to the chat. And if we don't get to them today, please email us and we will be sure to get your questions answered. So the first question here is from Mark Judeman. Yes, are flow batteries ready for prime time? If so, are they cheaper per watt hour than lithium ion? You know, from a, a home standpoint, know that, you know, you're looking at more of an industrial application. I think there are some real economic advantages. Um, you know, when we get into all the new cool technologies and all the new manufacturers coming on with this design or that design, um, where we run into is, okay, you've got that in a setting that you're experimenting with it. Can you take that to um, production? Okay, you can do that commercially viable production of that uh, new type of battery. All right, now who's gonna produce it? So now we build a plant that can uh, generate a volume of these uh, this battery type. And how many years does it take to build that plant? And in the meantime, has a better mousetrap come along and taken, uh, you know, you've got your stranded capital investment, right? So we've got a lot of that flow batteries sound like another part of the solution. And it's not just one type that's going to be the solution. So I think it's definitely there. There's some great advantages. Um, uh, but we see that, you know, uh, a lot of talk about this battery system, this chemistry, um, but okay, but tell me, when can you bring that to us? Oh, you know, in 2028. So great, great. Well, uh, what do we have before then? <laughs> so that's, you know, where we're going. And at the same time, things are going very fast. We really got to have, take it out of the lab in a commercial production uh, ability and then to produce it commercially. So those are the fun things that we have to get over to get into something that's more cost effective. Thank you, Dan. We have another question here from Roxanne Lincoln. If we use a battery backup and are a Northwestern Energy customer, what are the requirements as far as switching from grid to backup? Um, it's a, a net metering agreement like we do with a, a standard solar system. Um, really, you know, it's behind the meter. It's a customer's world. Our side of the meter is where the utility has control to that meter. And after the meter, it's our control. So uh, 
so no more permitting and, and such besides the net metering app. So you could send power back in. But what you do with your home and how much power you use from your battery, your size of battery is all up to you. And uh, I'd hate to see a shift there because I don't want somebody telling me how many solar panels I can have on, on my place. And, um, you know, I think and I, we have seen some stuff where uh, well, our local utility has, you know, gone and says uh, things like, oh, Dan, you're oversizing the system. And it's like, well, utility, you don't know what you're talking about. Thank you very much. Maybe this is not where you spend your energy. Um, you just provide us power and, and let us send power back to you. Um, so I hope that answers your question. Right, and we have another question here from Scott Moses. Where would you recommend locating a home battery in an accessory dwelling unit over a garage? Should it be located within a within the condition space? Yes, absolutely. You want them in the condition space. Um, uh, an outbuilding, a garage. I, I love those locations. Um, you know, you think about a battery. It's a lot of energy in a, in a small space. It's like uh, a can of gasoline. Well, we're not getting that energy density yet, but we'll be well the way it's going. So yeah, an outbuilding near, uh, in a conditioned space, but also near your electric distribution panel, or you need to run power to and from your main panel in the house. So locating is, is, um, is a good factor of how that would work. So it sounds like, um, uh, the other thing you could do is take power from your your outbuilding there to the main panel in the house with some more conductors and conduit. Okay, thank you. We have one more question here, um, or a couple actually. Good. We'll have one from Mark Dudeman asking what are the limits on peak draw from batteries? For instance, is there a problem with startup loads from electrical motors? Yeah, great question. So um, it depends on the size of the motor, of course, to start it, but a, a 10 kilowatt hour battery or larger, you know, we've got the capability to start quite a, a big motor. Plus the, the lithium chemistries are much better at putting out a lot of power in a short amount of time, just so we need to start, start a big motor. Um, again, that's why we have incredible acceleration in electric vehicles, that power is there. So how big of a battery you need depends on the motor itself um, and also the inverter. So the inverter might be the weak link in between the two. So the inverter is large enough to convert that DC power to AC power and the battery's big enough to sustain the voltage so it doesn't sag. Um, uh, you know, a small like automotive size battery um, would be in lith with lithiums. Probably would have a hard time starting a lot of motors, but we're looking at, um, you know, much larger than that five kilowatt type, uh, kilowatt hour type system. Uh, and above, we're really not going to have uh, much problem starting motors. A lot of the, a lot of times when it comes to motorcycles, it'd be like the water pump. Uh, typically, in a, in a residential setting, a uh, water pump is the largest surge load, and then they'll come on at the same time a washer and dryer main you know, working together. You know, another way around that, of course, is the soft start pumps that use a lot less power uh, when they start when they surge. So, but lithium is going to largely solve that problem over the lead acid world that we all work with. Excellent, I really appreciate these detailed answers, Dan. We have another question here from Vicki Watson about um, a panels, excuse me, about panels on a detached garage. So Vicki's wondering that she has a detached garage with a line that delivers power to the house. The garage is not heated. So she's asking, you know, do, should she have the batteries in the house if the garage is not heated? Well, yes, that's, uh, we'll commonly put them in, in the house. Um, but you have solar panels on the garage. So what you'd want to do is bring that solar DC power over to the house if you place the battery there. Um, 
The other thing you could do with your garage is possibly take a, a corner of the building and have an insulated space, um, insulate it really well where the batteries and inverter uh, are located um, with a small electric uh, heater and a small super insulated space, keep that battery warmer uh, during the winter time and be thermostatically controlled to take care of itself. Um, so you've got some options there. The best case is is in the home where you're already heating um, and you've already got a conditioned space. And one follow-up question there is, Vicky's wondering if there's some kind of online resource that you might be aware of where you could put in your electricity usage, how much your solar panels produce, and it could calculate the size of battery you'd need for two to three days of backup. Dan, are you familiar with some kind of resource like that? Um, from a battery standpoint, not really. Um, it, uh, I can see where it'd be helpful. You know, we got enough variables there and a lot of times there's a, a couple of technical questions. It's, uh, we sure have tried to make things as automatic as we can for folks, but that's really, you know, a good installer should be able to give you some numbers on that. And you say, here, here are my loads. You tell me um, how much power, uh, you know, we're talking about here and the size of battery that you would propose and what's my, how, how many hours do I have of runtime? So it's a great question to be running by an installer and uh, see, see what they're saying. And, and, you know, if they come up with, well, that's 7.1 hours, I say beware because anybody that quantifies to that level has made a bunch of assumptions to get to that number. And so I like to say, okay, here's an approach, here's some assumptions, and this is how many hours we would have a runtime or how many days of runtime. Or let's do this in June now uh, with these variables, blah, 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 you know, and to put numbers together. So no, I don't know of any direct um, resource like that but that's what your solar guys are, should be doing for you. Get you those numbers. And, you know, that's the world we live in, part of our responsibility. Wonderful. And there's a follow-up question I see in the chat about, you know, who installs batteries in Missoula? And I'll just jump in to say that we have a installer directory on the montanarenewables.org website where we list a lot of installers across the state who are our members and they indicate what technologies they work on. We'll be updating that directory soon with the most current information for 2022, but right now you can get a pretty good idea of who near you installs batteries from that directory. Uh, with that, I will say that we're getting right up close to time. So if we did not get to your question, please email us. You can email us at info at montanarenewables.org and we can be sure to get your questions answered. And I would also just like to give another big warm thank you to Dan Vanborg for being with us today to talk about this topic. I know so many of us are really excited about storage and batteries and trying to figure out how we can make it work for our homes and our businesses. So it's a pleasure to be able to have you here to talk a little bit more about that. Um, Thank you. We are going to be having another one of these talks next month. Our topic will be microgrids. We would be very excited to see you here again in April. So we hope we do. Thank you all for coming and have a really wonderful day.